Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guests. Last year we brought you two programs, one on fiction and one on nonfiction of major writings in this country, and we had three guests, and we invited them back this year to look at some new books that deal with, on the first show, nonfiction, and next week we'll look at fiction. I'm so pleased to welcome three of my colleagues who are very extensive in their readings, and we found out last year that many of you called in wanting to know where to get those books. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to review books, and I welcome to the program, first of all, Annie McKinley, who holds the master's degree in speech communication from Eastern Washington University and on the faculty at North Idaho College. Uh, Annie, thanks for coming back this year. We look forward to these two programs. Thanks for being invited back. And Denise Clark is our second guest. She holds a master's degree in library science from Western Michigan University. And uh, again, thank you for coming back, Denise. I always send everyone to you in the library. You are a walking computer when it comes to uh, reading and, and knowing materials. And so thank you for being with us. Thanks, Tony. And our third guest is Dr. Deborah Sprague, who holds a PhD in English from University of Washington, Seattle, uh, and welcome back. And she teaches in the field of English, and that's her degree uh, is in that field. Thank you too, Deborah, for being with us. We look forward to the interview. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of general questions, and I look across the table, and it's covered with books. <laughs> I know all three of you are great lovers of books, and what a way to uh, engage in a journey through life in reading. Um, and, and you just have a wealth of information from that, and, and you articulate that so well. Uh, Denise, I think I'll start with you on this first question. And I know last year you told us from your childhood that you've been a reader. Uh, rather than probably getting into the reasons why you became a reader, I would, and I'd like all three of you to answer this, would you explain to viewers why reading is so valuable? Why would you encourage people that are somewhat hesitant in reading, maybe a little lazy sometimes, What's so valuable about reading a variety of books? Um, actually, I, I, it's, it's hard for me to, to you know, s speak for other, other people, but I find it that it enriches my life. I cannot imagine how impoverished I would feel my life to be if I weren't a reader. I mean, first of all, I'm a very curious person. I think one of the reasons I became a librarian was because I couldn't determine what field I wanted to stay in. I couldn't, I'd start a degree in anthropology, and then I'd switch to psychology, and then I'd switch to archaeology. I'd, you know, I was all over the map, and I thought, well, Denise, you know, if you become a librarian, uh, you, you will have all of that at your fingertips, and you can just read about any subject you're, you know, you desire. You and know? you have done so. And I have done so. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, Deborah, let's go to you next. Uh, what do you get out of reading, or what would you advise other people to look for in reading? I would say a lot of the same things that Denise does. I, I read just because I want to know about things other than what I'm doing. And in fact, I'm in the middle of a shift of, of trying to do something else here in a few years. And partly it's just because I have a lot of interest and I want to do as much as possible. And I can find the information that I want in books. I don't necessarily even have to talk to someone else. There's, there's just so much wonderful information out there. But, and that would cover the, non, the nonfiction, certainly. There are other reasons maybe that we read fiction, but for the nonfiction, I, there's just so many wonderful writers and so many wonderful things to learn. I know you're so curious, and you are. You, you, you're amazing how many interests you have in, in as far as your degrees or your future, maybe occupation. Any the same thing to you? Uh, reading to me is just like a, a pure escape. I just love the words, and I love how people put the words together. And they, and then you know, like they said, we were laughing earlier. It makes you also very um, smart when you're watching Jeopardy. You can win almost all the Jeopardy questions when you're sitting on your couch. But um, it's just I don't know. I just came back from um, a, sh a short trip, and I was in the airport, and I was, as you know. These days, it takes longer than the airport than the actual flight. And I was looking around, and people were sitting and not with the book on these two and three hour layovers. And I was just thinking, how could they possibly do that? And it was like I almost wanted to steal their time. Yeah, thought, yeah. that's very valuable. We're going to start with you, Annie, because the time flies on the program. You have brought with you, I think, your your number one recommendation for this show on nonfiction. Would you tell us what the book is, the author, and what it's about? Okay. Uh, the book that I it brought with me for the nonfiction was Me Talk Pretty One Day by David Sedaris, if I mispronounced that. 
or some of the, especially the public television viewers might be familiar with him because he also does This American Life on public radio. Uh, it is a short, it's a collection of his life stories and he, um, he starts out talking about how uh, he was in speech therapy when he was in probably about the fifth grade because he never could say his S's. And so and how the class would always like, you'd have to, they'd say, David, it's 2.30, it's time for your therapy, and how he just hated that. And so he learned how to kind of go and trick the uh, speech therapist into uh, how he would find all these words that didn't have an S in them. So that was, that's his first story. And then he goes on to, he lives in Paris for a while, and, and that's where it really comes in. He talked pretty one day, he was in these French lessons, and they're, they're teaching him all these kind of bizarre things that he would probably never use. But he just has a wonderful sense of humor, and it's things that you can identify with, and after a while you kind of you think, oh my gosh, I'm a sick person, I can identify with this story, but it's so funny. And it's, uh, I also liked it too, because it's quick, you could, uh, it's one of these books that you can read one story, put it down for a while, pick it back up, but I plowed through it in one night, because I <laughs> thought it was so funny. Because you're, you're so interested, but it's the kind of book where you can, it's in sections, where you don't, they don't right. have to tie together, where you can... Right, he talks a lot about his childhood. Um, his, his sister, in fact, is a comedian, um, I believe she's on Saturday Night Live and stuff, and how all through her life her dad always made fun of her weight and stuff, and so she comes home one day in a, in a fat suit that doesn't tell him that it's a fat suit, and then he's just like so upset over this and stuff, and, but she's actually a comedian and does this stuff. So. so it's one of the themes in the book, um, not only dealing with a, a story of someone's travels through life, but I almost hear you saying that it has something to do with the human spirit, and, and not only you have humor, but it's, it's, is it encouraging to people to see how someone else has particularly struggled with certain um, oh, problems? Yeah, and that's what I think is great about the book, that he laughs at himself quite often, you know, being in these French lessons, and, and even people that come over to visit him in Paris, and they all want to go see the Eiffel Tower and stuff, and he is just so excited because Paris has 250 movie theaters, and he wants to take them to all these movie theaters, and they want to actually go to museums, and he just thinks that's really, really kind of strange, and so they usually ditch him and go off on their own and stuff, and so in the movie theaters he even talks about, but it is, it's too, it's a, uh, because um, uh, his mother dies in the book, but he doesn't really elaborate on this, it's kind of interesting, but, uh, but he, the family, uh, his, his father thinks that they could start this this band and go on kind of like the Lawrence Welk show and stuff, and so it's, uh, yeah, I would say it also deals, because he talks about trying to be an artist and the things that he has to deal with. And he has, at one point, too, he was a bit of drug addiction, didn't he? There was a bit there. It's definitely a dysfunctional family. <laughs> and, there's a, and there's an earlier collection called Naked. In the last essay, he's visiting a nudist colony. That, and that's a really, <laughs> that's an interesting collection, too. Yeah. Yeah, he's had a really kind of unusual life, it sounds like. Definitely. Uh, Deborah, I'm going to come over to you, or Dr. Sprague, and you have brought three books. Let's go through those, and then we'll come back to Denise, who has a, a real collection here, and as she talks, that you. You may want to join in because you've read some of those too, yeah. but to our oh, wonderful my, viewers, what are you recommending? My favorite, my top pick for the summer, and everyone in my family has read this, was, is called A Primate's Memoir by Robert Sapolsky, and he, um, he studies baboons, but he also is doing research, he's, he basically is a neuropsychologist, but he's doing research in aggression and stress, and this is kind of a story of his life and how he got into primatology and how he... Uh, why he's so involved in this particular type of research. And the reason I, I like this, I think, is he makes it very reader-friendly. It's anybody, you don't have to be an expert on neuropsychology or on baboons or on anything to be able to read it, but he's, and he's got a wonderfully irreverent sure. sense of humor. I'm going to read a quick passage. Sure. Uh, I joined the troop in the last year of the reign of Solomon. In those days, the other central members of the troop were Leah, Devorah, Aaron, Isaac, Naomi, and Rachel. I didn't plan beforehand to give the baboons Old Testament names. It just happened. A new adult male leaving the troop he grew up in would transfer into the troop, and during the few weeks when he'd vacillate about joining permanently, I would hesitate about giving him a name. I'd just refer to him in my notes as the new adult transfer, or Nat, or Nat, and by the, or that, that time he decided, or the, excuse me, or by the time he decided to stay forever, Nathaniel. Adam was first known as ATM for adult transfer male. The small kid, who was first abbreviated as the SML kid, then turned into Samuel on me. At that point, I just gave up and started handing out the prophets and the matriarchs and judges left and right. I would still occasionally stick with a purely descriptive name, Gums or Limp, for example, and I was way too insecure in my science to publish technical papers using those names. Everyone got a number then but the rest of the time I wallowed in biblical names. 
I've always liked Old Testament names, but I would hesitate to inflict Obadiah or Ezekiel on a child of mine, so I ran wild with the 60 baboons in the troop. Plus, clearly, I was still irritated by the years I spent toting my Time Life books on evolution to show my Hebrew school teachers, having them blanch at such sacrilege and tell me to put them away. It felt like a pleasing, pleasing revenge to hand out the names of the patriarchs to a bunch of baboons on the African plains. And with some sort of perversity that I suspect powers a lot of what primatologists do, I couldn't wait for the inevitable day that I could record in my field notebook that Nebuchadnezzar and Naomi were off blanking in the bushes. Well, I'm going I to can see why anyone <laughs> could read that. You don't have to be a, a PhD in the field. It's interesting. Yeah, I'm going to come to Denise and we'll come back. We'll yeah. go back and forth in the time we have. But uh, Denise and I were talking last night. Denise, you are very varied in your reading. Would you first tell the story of the two, two, two examples you have? Are, maybe you can go through those two books that, that this summer that you found so fascinating. One on spirituality and, and one was on uh, bees, well, I believe. I, right. Um, it, uh, bringing a title with me, or even two, was probably the most difficult decision I had to make today. Um, but two titles I read this summer that I really enjoyed, and, and I'll talk about the first one. It's called Following the Bloom Across America with Migratory Beekeepers by Douglas Wynott. Now, there's an interesting story uh, behind this book. I was reading another book on monarch butterflies by a Washington biologist called Chasing Monarchs by Robert Pyle. Now, Pyle, in his reading, mentions following the bloom. Well, he gave it a great review, and I thought, I love this book. He's a fine writer. Certainly, he has good taste. I will then, I'll look for this book and so read this. So one book leads to another one. One book leads to another. I'm always sitting with a book while I'm reading it, taking notes about the recommendations made by an author that I'm reading at the time. So, Following the Bloom was my next choice. So, I look in Amazon. I'm going to buy this book. It's not available. It's out of print, folks. I want to tell you that this wonderful book, <laughs> published by Stackpole in 1991, is no longer available. Now, what are our viewers going to do? <laughs> well, they they go on they go on the internet and they get into ABA, abebooks.com, which is what I did. Track down a copy of this in my one of my hometowns, Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I lived for two years called the bookstore owner there and said, you have a copy of a book I want to read called Following the Bloom. He said, it's wonderful. I have it at home. I'll sell it to you, but you can't have it right now. <laughs> well, what is the book about? It is. Um, Douglas Wynott is an English instructor, creative writing instructor, and a part-time beekeeper. And he fell in love with bees when he was about 10 years old. And he has this wonderful description of his first magical encounter with bees. He said that while he was walking with my dog and we were near home coming down a hill late in the afternoon, he found himself in a clearing set in a pocket in a sumac grove and he saw a beehive there. He said, I was standing in the flight path to the hives. The bees were coming over my head, over my shoulders, floating down the hill, tracing long, elegant arcs to the landing board of the hive. The rays of the setting sun were slanting through the dusty air in the tree branches, and as the bees flew through this light, they became luminous points of fire. The sun made the bees translucent and lit up the little drops of nectar they carried. It was enough to get me down the hill to the hive. He sat and watched those bees coming in the hive for a couple of hours, and that was his beginning love affair. But how eloquent he talks about that. It makes you visualize it. Absolutely. Now, he also did something else very unique that makes that book uh, so interesting. He took a journey across he the country. He took a journey across America with um, beekeepers, migratory beekeepers, who contract with um, uh, orchardists, for example, or fruit growers. And, and uh, these beekeepers will bring in their hives to pollinate the crops. And then the beekeepers, and what they do is they, they carry these big semi-loads of hives with bees in them, mind you, with a net over the, the semi, and then they hope to God they don't break down. 
because if they do, they've got live bees on the backs of these trucks. And, and not always getting them in legally? Not always getting them in legally. Many states don't like to see them come across the borders because they are, there's the African bee problem. Um, there are bee diseases that, you know, that can be very serious and so they're some states are very stringent in their bee inspections and... But then after doing so, all that journey, he wrote about it. Yes, he wrote about it. Back roads to... I, I just want you to get into some other books because this is also fascinating. I'm going to go back to Deborah, your second book that you would recommend. Um, this one's called In a Sunburned Country by Bill Bryson. A travel writer who really is just very humorous. I won't read a passage on this one, but it makes me want to go to Australia, and I never did before. To me, that's kind of a good sign of it. Yes. A, a good travel writer makes you just want to get the ticket right now and go. And, 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 and Australia is such a land of extremes. It just, it, and he is able to present things like statistics and just basic facts about the country and make them very entertaining. Um, and he does pretty much travel across the country and meets all kinds of very interesting, sometimes strange people. And Australia does sound like a wonderful It's part country. of his gift that he country. almost makes you feel like you're on the trip with he him. He does. And he's just very humorous. I guess I really got into humor this summer. So <laughs> both of these people had very interesting styles and we're both humans are very we have so many difficulties and recently we've had such a terrible yes. terrible tragedy with the the violence from the terrorists but uh, as the president said you know, getting back as best we can to our normal life that incorporating humor back in your life is very mm -hmm. important so this might be a good time for people to pick, yeah. choose those kind of books i'm going back to denise and get another book uh, i don't know where you want to do the one on the benedict spirituality or or another one but uh, i was intrigued with what you were talking about that well um i I, I really love this book. I I'm, I I very I pick my books on spirituality very carefully because there's so many faddish titles out on the uh, out on the market, and uh, so I, I I tend to approach them with a rather jaundiced you know view. Um, but I was reading an article about um, Sister Joan Chittister, who was with the Order of Saint Benedict, and she is very active feminist, and she's uh, a woman who's active in, in um, working to improve women's roles in the, in the church, uh, in the Catholic Church. And so I picked up this book after reading about her as a person in a, and, and her activities uh, in the church. And she wrote this little book called Wisdom Distilled from the Daily, Living the Rule of St. Benedict Today. And one of the reasons I love this, I mean, <laughs> Um, she says in her book that all in all, the rule of St. Benedict is designed for ordinary people who live ordinary lives. It was not written for priests or mystics or hermits or aesthetics. It was written by a layman for laymen. It was written to provide a model of spiritual development for the average person who intends to live life beyond the superficial or the uncaring. It is written for people with deeply spiritual sensibilities and deeply serious concerns. Um, and she has been living in a mon monastic community for over 30 years and living by the rule of St. Benedict. And in um, the rule covers prayer and at, as the center and lectio, um, lecture readings from the scriptures. Um, she talks about community as the basis for human relationships, that living in a monastery does not mean that you remove yourself from the community of, of human beings and human needs and interactions. And so she brings, she breaks down the rule of St. Benedict as, it, as people can apply that rule to today's, um, today's life. I see Annie motion. Have you read one of those books, one of those you're talking about? Or? No, but uh, no, um, I'm, I'm also one of the um, yoga teachers here at the college, and so um, I always teach a little bit about spirituality. And, this is the great thing. I look over at Denise's book to see which ones have our library emblem on it, so mm -hmm. I know if I can go check it out. Now, yeah. uh, Denise has several other books. Is there one there that all three of you have read, that, uh, or you're aware of what she's brought with you? Okay. Is there anything there that... I think all three of us have read... Um, then why don't we this deal with that one? By, uh, then again, this shows that your great variety <laughs> in reading. <laughs> this is about an undertaker? Yes. Uh, this was written by an, an undertaker and a poet. I might add. Uh, yeah. he's, yes, he's a published poet and well known as a poet. And he is also the only undertaker in Milford, Michigan, which is a tiny little community. Since and you came from Michigan, you're also from that I, town. Yes, I am. I know exactly. Just a few miles from where I grew up. So 
Um, and this book won the 1998 National Book Award. It was National Book Award winner in 1998. Is. Thomas Lynch. And it is called The Undertaking. And it is a collection of essays, actually, about, about being a poet, about being the town's only undertaker, um, about visiting his roots in Ireland. Uh, he goes back to Ireland. He's an Irish Catholic, a, one of nine children, growing up in this very active. And he followed in his father's footsteps. His father was the town undertaker in Milford, Michigan. And Thomas Lynch returned to Milford to follow his father's tr uh, trade. But um, he has an essay in here that's wonderful. I don't know whether everyone remembers this, about him laying out his father, preparing his father for burial. At his father's death, it's very moving. Annie, would you like to? You read that book too, right? Yeah, I was just, I, but I've read it probably about, I want to say, after the show last year, I think. In fact, somebody recommended it. And the interesting thing was, you know, somebody recommends a book on being an undertaker, and you think, oh, well, I'll put that on the low end of my <laughs> list. But it is, it's just fascinating. And his caring and how he knew that, knows the different people is. And the writing is, it's absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful. Deborah, uh, you said that? Yes, I, and there's, he's got another one, too, that I can't remember the name. Of course, it's not on here. Um, I can see that it's the front of a picture of a taxi, the, the white shirt and the tie. But anyway, he's, so he, he is prolific. But I was also interested in the fact that he talks about how the profession of, uh, of undertaking has changed, that, that we have, as a culture have changed in how we deal with dying and death mm -hmm. and the dead. and. And so, so there's I a like lot of things could be helpful to people. Mm -hmm. yes. We all experience this, of course, in our yeah. families, and, our, and so that could be, yeah. could be a very personal connection. And he just he has a beautiful style. It, it, he, even though he writes poetry, the, I mean, the poetry comes through in the, in the essay form. Mm -hmm. It really is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. that, it is. The clock is really moving. I'm going to go to the third book that, Deborah, you have. Oh, here. this one, I think, is kind of interesting. I read this summer, and then it, it really fits in again with what has been happening since September 11th, because it's a, a, by a man named Robert Kaplan called Eastward to Tartary, Travels in the Balkans, the Middle East, and the Caucasus. And he actually goes through and, and gives a lot of the background and historical, um, what has happened in those particular areas and how we've gotten to where we are. And it, it sounds like, oh, it's politics and geography and all of that in it. But it's, it is fascinating, and I found it. In fact, I, I think I'm going to go back and reread it now after what's happened. I, the first time through, it was just really interesting to me, but I've forgotten many of the details. But there's this one paragraph, I think, that gives a sense of, of what I'm talking about. And he's, he's in Turkey right now. The bus left Ankara, and soon we were traveling through the lonely vastness of baked yellow hillsides that sloped and twisted gently mile after mile with a silence and clarity bequeathed by the dryness and absence of trees. Later came a green poplar-lined river valley with silvery blue water then mountains, then more bleached hills. A steward passed by with scented water, cakes, and Pepsi. I talked with a woman wearing a headscarf who wrote for an Islamic newspaper. She spoke easily about the Islamic extremism of the Taliban in Afghanistan and about the unspoken competition between the new Islamic nouveau riche in Anatolia and the Jewish business people in Istanbul. She became my de facto translator for the day. There was little unusual about this woman who was at once assertive and religious. Islam, like Christianity and Judaism, can be a crude, generic term. Just as Christians in Lebanon during the war-torn 1970s and 1980s acted differently from the ev evangelical Christians in the American Midwest, Turkish Islamists were very different from Islamists in Algeria, Egypt, or Iran. Here, women had achieved far more freedom than in most Arab societies and spoke freely. Because Turkey's religious revival followed industrial and political modernization that in turn produced an authentic middle class rather than an artificial one created by overnight oil wealth and with a tyrant in charge, as in Iran, Turkey's Islamists differed from their Ira Iranian counterparts. And then just a little side note, because Afghanistan had experienced very little modernization at all, its Islamic movement, a creature of overcrowded refugee camps in Pakistan, was even more primitive. I think it, it really does. It's amazing how that book uh, would be so um, educational after this terrible, terrible violence. Uh, but, but again, such an excellent point about uh, their different, um, different uh, experiences in different countries mm -hmm. with the same uh, social background or, or different uh, aspect of religion. Mm -hmm. I think it teaches a lot of tolerance, too, for not, not guilt by association. Mm -hmm. uh, we have time, I think, uh, 
for another book from Denise here. Well, I have to. This, this is a book I love. This I, I have a, a weakness for uh, narratives of polar exploration. <laughs> and so this one is one called The Endurance, Shackleton's Legendary Antarctic Expedition by Carolyn Alexander. Uh, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with the story of Shackleton's uh, Antarctic Expedition, but he left um, England in 1914 and set sail. And his, he was going to do the only thing that had not been done, which was cross Antarctic, the Antarctic on foot, Antarctica on foot with sleds, you know, go across. And uh, the Endurance was trapped in ice. Ultimately, it was crushed. They had to leave the ship. They had to move all their supplies off. Uh, they spent over 400 days on the sea or on ice flows before they found, um, uh, before they, they had to set sail. The sea was breaking up, and they landed on a little place called Elephant Island, which was absolutely barren. From Elephant Island, Ernest Shackleton took with him about three or four other men. They sailed in a 22-foot boat hold James Caird over 800 miles of open sea, the Weddell Sea, to a little whaling village on George Isle, uh, Georgia Island. And it was like hitting a needle in a haystack. The seas were so bad, they were, sw more, they were swamped uh, several times. They bailed like crazy to save themselves. They couldn't even get, his, his navigator could not get a good reading, but they, they hit George Island. That's how good the navigate. It's never been. No one's done it again. No one what, has been able to. What an adventurous story! I know. And I know. I'm sure you felt the the tension it's with just, them. It was. I know. He, yeah. he. All of these men came out of this expedition alive. On that note, I bring the program to conclusion. Well, you've really, I think, uh, whetted the appetite of our viewers, and we thank all three of you for being with us to talk uh, this week about nonfiction books. Good news to our viewers is that you'll be back next week, and we're going to talk about fiction uh, for those who prefer that approach. And a lot of people do both, as you do. Uh, and I hope that uh, our viewers will feel free to uh, uh, call Denise Clark. We put the number up of uh, your phone number. You can give them more information how to get these books or other books that we didn't get to. And, and I know that you would like to, to be able to communicate. You, you love encouraging people to do that. So. Uh, Again, thank uh, all three of you for being here. Uh, I've enjoyed immensely your comments, and as I've indicated, we'll have you back again next week. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will join us again next week. At this same time, we'll interview the same guest on Books of Fiction. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running, entirely college-produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>